I just kick it over. Good morning, everyone. If you could go ahead and open up to the book of John, chapter 8. We'll wait till that goes away. It's not me. Okay. All right. John chapter 8 is where we're at, and today we'll be on verse 37 through 47. And uh, we've been in John chapter 7 and John chapter 8, and here Jesus is having a, a big dialogue with the Pharisees, as we've covered many times. This is happening at the Feast of Tabernacles. But this, this is one of the longest dialogues we have of Jesus talking to the Pharisees. And as we covered in the last two weeks, some of the Pharisees, according to John, believed and uh, we, we spent some time looking at what this belief actually is. Many times today, if you ask someone, do they believe in Jesus? And they say yes, we assume that that means that person is a Christian who has been forgiven, who is saved, who is on their way to heaven. The book of John is not laid out like that. Oftentimes, belief is used, or even the word that a person is a disciple, and you have to read the context to see if it is true belief or if this person is truly a disciple or not. So are there people, even in your life, that you know of that claim to be Christians, claim to believe in Jesus, but yet are not? And most every single one of us can say yes, right? So this is not new to us. We're aware of this. This is also happening there during this conversation in John chapter 8. So all people who say they're believers are not true believers. As we looked at last week in verses 25 through 26, just to kind of do a quick summary on that, a person who is who saved has believed in Christ for salvation and repented of sin, but continues to do that. So they continue in belief, they continue in repentance, and that is very, very important. Uh, two key points we looked at last week is that true belief results in a state of continual submission to the teaching of Jesus. And number two, true belief results in breaking free from continual enslavement to sin. So that's what we looked at last week. Jesus said, if you abide in my words, you're my true disciple. And he's talking to those who apparently, supposedly, just believed. But very quickly, as Jesus continues to share words with them, they're going to be not abiding, not remaining in, not staying with him. In fact, they go the opposite way and hate the words that are coming out of his mouth. So they no longer are abiding with him, and it is revealed. Also, it is revealed that they are slaves to sin. And a person who has truly believed in Christ for salvation is not enslaved to sin. There will be, they, we will sin sometimes, obviously. We're not perfect until we're glorified in heaven, but you're not enslaved to that sin. These Pharisees remained not abiding by the words of Jesus, picking and choosing, and they also remained uh, enslaved to sin. So those are marks of not a believer, but an unbeliever. Now let's look at, uh, let's go into verse 37. And uh, we'll look at verse 37 through 47 today. And again, this is, this is carrying on just where we left off last time we were together in the book of John, that all those who claim to believe uh, are not necessarily truly believing in Christ for salvation. And there's going to be some more marks as we go through today that really lay out true belief and false belief. So verse 37. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father and do what you have heard from your, and you do what you do from your father, have heard from your father. I'm going to read verse 38 again. <laughs> it almost was Trey Talley's translation there. That's not good. Uh, there's a small little place in Arkansas that can stay with me on that. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot 
bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, I do not believe, you do not believe me, which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us today to look into, to focus on, to, and to meditate in a good way on. God, I pray that we would listen to these truths, and uh, may we understand them. And may we see that not all who claim to believe in Jesus or claim to be right with you are truly are. Uh, as these Pharisees relied on themselves, they relied on their ancestry, they relied on what they could do to make themselves right with you, we see the words of Jesus saying that they are the opposite of right with you and they're following Satan. God, may our lives uh, as true believers be ones that are obvious that we are your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you look back at verse 37, again, he is talking to the Pharisees. Many of them would be teachers in the Sanhedrin itself. These are the ones that, uh, that dress different than everyone else, act different than everyone else. They're judging everyone else. They are the who's who, supposedly, of knowledge of the Bible. And yet, look at verse 37, what Jesus is going to say. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So the Pharisees often boast of being connected to two primary patriarchal figures in the Old Testament. Moses, right, we've covered that multiple times and will as we go forward in the book of John. They claim to be on the seat of Moses and, and take his responsibility uh, upon themselves. But also they go back further to Abraham. And they claim to be children of Abraham. And this is their boast. This is their claim. Uh, Jesus points out, though, that even though they're genetically connected to Abraham, they have a different father. So what is he talking about here? Well, he's acknowledging, yes, they're genetically connected back to Abraham. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? And so the 12 tribes make up Israel, you could say. So they are, these Pharisees could trace their lineage back. And it was a huge boast to know your lineage. And for many Jews and Israelites, they could do this because their records were still really well preserved. And so some of them could trace themselves way back. Is it important, for instance, that Jesus Christ is connected all the way back to Abraham? And of course, the answer is yes. So you open up the New Testament, and you can read of his genealogy. Why is that important? Because that was laid out in prophecy ahead of time. He had to be connected to uh, Abraham, had to be connected to Isaac, had to be connected to Jacob, had to be connected to Judah, had to be connected to Jesse. All these are prophecies that are coming true all the way to David, right? So that it is important, but they are using this to trace basically their salvation. Can a person be saved according to who they're related to? No, but this is their boast. This is their brag. We are the offspring of Abraham. So how can you say these things about us? We're not enslaved to sin, and we're perfectly right with God. It's what they're thinking. Uh, so we're going to lay this out as we go through. But here Jesus points out a significant difference that they're not connected to Abraham. There are big differences because primarily Abraham listened and obeyed God's direction. The Pharisees did not. Their failure to listen to God reveals that they have a different father. And during this section... You really have Jesus putting forth what we might call a paternity test. Who is your father? If it's Abraham, if it's God, then these things will be true. If it's not, then these other things will be true. You say Abraham is your father. You say God is your father. Let's put you to the test and see who your father truly is. So this is the facade the Pharisees live in. They think they're right, act like they're right with God children of Abraham, we represent God. Remember, they run the temple. 
They run the, they, they, are the, they are the epicenter of the Israelite religion of that day. But are they truly representing God? So you have God, the Son, who's going to put them through the test. Uh, to go back, hold your place there and look in the book of Genesis. A couple of times we'll be there. Uh, but start off in Genesis 15, 1 through 6. And here we'll find that, uh, that Abraham, when he heard the word, that he obeyed, he listened. And verse 38 of John says, I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. So there's different hearing going on here, different listening going on. In Genesis 15, 1 through 6, you have the Lord, a pre-incarnate, so pre-flesh uh, uh, Christ uh, appearing to Abraham. And that, listen how he, he gives the words to Abraham and listen to the obedience that comes from Abraham. So after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he came, said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So what do we gather from there? All right, this is, the, this is the key we're bringing forward that Jesus is going to be pointing out. The, Lord, the word of the Lord was delivered to Abram. What did Abram do? He listened. He truly heard. He listened, applied, and he believed God. So he believed, okay? This is extremely important. A true believer. The Pharisees say they believe, but here this first mark you might say on this paternity test is, do they receive the word of the Lord like Abraham did? And number one, as we go through this kind of a paternity test of who their father is, uh, that we find out that they're not like Abraham because they reject the word of the Lord. They have Jesus, God in the flesh, there in front of them speaking directly uh, to them. And what are they doing? They're not abiding in it. They're rejecting it. Consider that John 8, 31 that we looked at earlier. Hold your place in Genesis, but feel free to go back to John 8. Uh, how does this differ from the critical mark of a true disciple from Jesus' words in John 8, 31? Uh, this is it. They're not abiding in it. Jesus says, if you abide in my words, then you are truly my disciple. There are people who claim to believe. There are people who claim to be disciples. As we looked at after Jesus fed the thousands, many of them claimed to be his disciple. Jesus began to teach using his words, using the teaching, and, and they left. Why? Because they did not abide. They did not stay. They did not remain. Those who remain are true disciples of him. Uh, so this is a big difference. Those that supposedly believed in Jesus uh, have a dialogue with Jesus, and it becomes obvious that they're not truly his disciples. And when we use that word disciple, it's important to remember what it means. It just means student. It means a, a, a learner and to submit to another and absorb what they have, what the teaching that they have. So we are to be disciples submitting ourselves to the word of God. We do not create our own religion. We do not create our own Jesus. We do not create our own views of God. How do we get those things? We gather it from God's revealed word. So we are students of God, students of Christ, disciples of Christ, however you want to put it, as we submit to his word, all right? Uh, true belief is accompanied by listening and submitting to the word of God. This is what Abraham did. He heard the word of the Lord. He listened. He obeyed, implied it, and believed. Uh, the Pharisees hear the word of the Lord, and they do not accept it. They absolutely reject it. Now, how will the Pharisees take Jesus telling them that they are not actually connected to Abraham? They are going to be furious about this, absolutely furious. This is their foundation. This is their, what holds them up. This is their salvation, is they are connected to Abraham. If that is removed, they have nothing. And to say that they're not connected to Abraham, 
They're going to get furious about this. Look down at verse 39. They answered him, Abraham is our father. And it's, it's hard to read, but you can, I think you could put exclamation points all through there, all right? They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. So here Jesus reveals the second reason they are not children of Abraham. It's their works. It's what they do. Their activities, their works do not reveal that they are actually connected to Abraham. Now this is important for us. Anytime we talk about works, I like to throw this out there to make sure we all understand. Works, your deeds, your activities do not save you. But they can serve to reveal those who are saved. All right? So God does not weigh our good deeds against our bad deeds. If you did more good than bad, you get to go to heaven now, right? That's not it. We are not saved by our works. But here, Jesus says, if you truly believed, like Abraham did, it was reflected in his life. So a true believer, their works, their activities, what they do in life, their, their heart is changed, their desires have changed, their will has changed, and it affects their activities as well. Uh, their works, the Pharisees, if they were truly connected to Abraham in belief, it would be shown in their works. But it is not. So he says they are not connected to Abraham because their works do not show it. Now, look back over at Genesis and go to chapter 18 just to review a little bit. And this will be, a, again, just kind of a review about Abraham, why they keep regarding going back to him. And really, they're, they're basically living off a of borrowed faith. It is not their faith that is borrowed faith. Abraham truly had faith. Is Abraham's faith sufficient enough to save them? And the answer is no. Abraham's faith cannot save them, all right? But that's what they tend to be doing here. Anyway, uh, look at the works here of Abraham, activities, how, how his true belief plays out in his life. Look at verses 1 through 8. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Yet a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Will I bring a morsel of bread? And you may refresh yourselves, and after you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abram went quickly into the tent of, to Sarah and said, Quick, three says of fine flour, knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them until uh, under the tree while they ate. All right, so long story, what do we have going on here? Well, back at verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Okay, so how does this contrast or compare to Fer the Pharisees? The Lord appears to Abraham. What does he do? What are his activities? He, he's showing incredible hospitality to them, right? He is working. He's getting his servants to help. He's preparing a big meal for them. It's, it, he's welcoming Jesus with everything he has. Uh, do the Pharisees show the Lord great hospitality when he shows up in front of them? Do he, they do not go make curds to bring to Jesus, all right? They do not uh, have a barbecue for him like Abraham did. What do they do instead? They argue, they fight with the Lord, and they truly desire to kill him. And this is important. The person's conduct, conduct displays paternity, and the Pharisees have failed the paternity test. The Lord shows up to Abraham. He stops what he's doing. He bows down. He shows incredible hospitality, making a meal, preparing for them, doing everything that he can possibly do, washing feet. Just, he is submissive. He is welcoming. He's hospitable. The Lord shows up to the Pharisees. If they were connected to Abraham, you would expect the same thing. Great hospitality, right? 
Is it welcome? Is there anything we can do to you? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Is there anything that we... No. Instead, they fight with him. They hate him. And they actually want to murder him as well. Uh, just again to think of, of on the, uh, Abraham. Uh, turn over to... We're done in Genesis, by the way. But go over to Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, look at verse 8 through 10. Don't lose your place there in John. And just, just again to just quickly review about Abraham... Hebrews chapter 11 brings him up again and just mentions his obedient faith again. Uh, verse 8 in Hebrews chapter 11, we'll go through 10. He says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place where he was to receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, for he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Again, this is just a couple of sentences written. What do we find, though? Uh, he obeyed. He heard the word of the Lord. He obeyed, and he went. Uh, the Pharisees are hearing the word of the Lord they are not submitting, they are not obeying, and they are rejecting. So what is this showing? Once again, they are not truly connected to Abraham spiritually. And that's far more important than being connected to Abraham genetically. Uh, that genetic, genetic connections to someone of great faith in the past it does not guarantee you have right faith at all. Right? It's not a genetic connection that gets you into heaven. All right, look at verse 41. Go back to John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, we'll move on to verse 41, and we'll get to our third point here. Jesus says, You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. All right, so here, same flow again. Jesus is saying that Abraham is not their father because their works are revealing it. They're not the same. Uh, Abraham heard the word of the Lord. He obeyed, and it was revealed in his life, his entire life, all the way till he's in heaven. They're just re being revealed. Uh, Pharisees are not abiding in the word. They're rejecting the word. Their works are, do not connect them back to, to Abraham as well. Uh, so now he's saying you're doing the same works your father did. So this is implying that they have a different father that is not Abraham. So what does this mean? Well, they take this to mean, it says in verse 41, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. All right, so number three, they do the works of another father. And this is important because who your spiritual father is can be revealed by how you live. Uh, even now, this is, this is, this is not, it's not a perfect example because if we stare at someone long enough, you will see them eventually sin, all right? Uh, but there is a pattern here. And if you're continually doing works that are not obedient to God, it, revealing that you're in a slavery mentality, enslaved to sin, then your, your works, your life, your deeds, your actions are revealing that God is not your father. You're not connected to the way Abraham was who had right belief. You have another father. And he's throwing this out there right now. We'll get, get revealed here in a minute. Uh, what do they do to this? They are furious about this as well. You're saying that we have another father. No, we are not born out of sexual immorality and, and our life is showing it. They say, but Jesus says, no, their works are not showing it. Now, to cover a couple of passages here, look over at Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, Christians do work for the Lord, but our works, our right, deeds of righteousness, come after salvation and not before salvation. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved to work for God. We're saved for work uh, for God. God saves us to do his works. Uh, on this earth, he has works for us to do. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Talking to the believers, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. 
It is the gift of God, not a result of works. Extremely important. We are absolutely saved by grace. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The beautiful passage here that, of course, lets us know that we are not contributory. We're not doing something to bring to God in order that he sees that we are somehow deserving of salvation. We're saved by absolute grace. And, of course, if you think that you are bringing something to God worthy of your salvation, you're not seeing yourself as you truly should. We are sinners who deserve the wrath and curse of God. We deserve eternal damnation. There's nothing good in and of ourselves. But Jesus Christ is perfect. He is perfectly obedient. We are saved by grace as God supernaturally moves on us, convicts us of sin, and we see the beauty of Christ and what he has done to bring about our salvation. All right, so we're saved by grace, not a result of works. But now what does he say about works? Works are going to follow us. They are going to come... Uh, this is going to be a changed life. If a person says they're a believer and there are no works at all, what does this reveal? It could reveal, as Jesus is pointing out to the Pharisees, that even though you say God is your father, you have a different father. All right. Look at verse 10 there in Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's beautiful. When you really think about this, God has saved you. He has made you alive. But not only that, he has works prepared for you in advance that you are going to be doing. That's, a, that's awesome to think about. God has not only sovereignly brought you to himself for salvation, but he has sovereignly laid out good works in your life that you are to be doing. Now, again, salvation... And then deeds of righteousness, works of righteousness, as far as, as far as God has prepared you for these things. But there, the Pharisees are not revealing that they are connected to true faith and true righteousness because their works are not of God. Their works are revealing they have a different father. Uh, notice that the works don't save, but works will accompany those who are saved. Uh, another passage, Matthew 7. Turn with me over there. Matthew 7, 17 through 19. Matthew 7, 17 through 19, Jesus says, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. What is this saying? This is saying something very similar to what Jesus is saying in John 8, verse, verse 40 and verse 41. Very similar to what we're finding over there in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. All right, that there, what, uh, uh, the, the fruit of a tree is very revealing. Uh, and he's obviously comparing this to people. And it's a, it's a metaphor, it's an analogy, it's a comparison, right? So a diseased tree, what does it produce? It produces diseased fruit. Fruit. I can vouch for this. I have, I, I, I have tried to raise peach trees in my yard for the last several years. Uh, the tree is diseased, and the fruit comes out. It looks pretty, but there is nasty stuff inside of the fruit. The fruit is very revealing. It's like the test, all right? Is this tree diseased? Then you get the fruit. You open it up. You're like, yes, it is diseased. Do not eat this, kids. Throw it to the turtles, all right? It, it, don't leave it there. All right, so, so the, it's obvious, right? So a diseased tree, what does it produce? It produces diseased fruit. This is talking about a person's life as well. If a person is not a true believer, what is produced? Things that reveal they're not a true believer. If a person is a true believer, they will produce nice peaches, all right? Good fruit that, that is edible, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful because the, the healthy tree produces healthy fruit. So it is in our lives. We are not saved by our works, but our fruit, our work is very revealing of who we truly are. Uh, let's move on to John chapter 8. Look at verse 42. Verse 42. So point number three was 
They do the works of another father. Jesus has alluded to that they alluded that they do not have Abraham as their father. And they say, even one father, we have God as our father. All right. So number four, they do not love Jesus. According to verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. So this also lets us know they are not of Abraham because they do not love Jesus. Uh, can a person love God and simultaneously hate Jesus? And the answer is no, unless they've created an idol for who they think God is, you might say. But you cannot love the one true God and still hate God the Son. Uh, the Salvation is a work of the Trinity. It's a work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And for a person to say or claim they love God and yet hate the Spirit, that you can't do such a thing. To say that you love God the Father and yet you hate the Son, you can't do such a thing. To say that you love the Son but you hate God the Father, you can't do this because there's one God. All right? So they are claiming to love God but they hate the Son of God. So Jesus says this is very revealing because if God were your Father, you would also love me. Uh, what does God say? God the Father say at Jesus' baptism even, right? He is pleased with him or the transfiguration. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him is what God the Father says of the Son. And then we have the ultimate approval that Jesus dies and God raises him from the dead. Uh, he is absolutely sinless. He is the Son of God, but they hate him. So hatred for the, the, hatred for the Son reveals that a person does not truly love God. And, and you see some of this today uh, as well. People will claim to be right with God, and they'll claim to believe in God, but they do not believe in Jesus. Can you do such a thing? And the answer is obviously no, right? And this is very common. They'll create a generic God in their mind, a uh, God that's going to love them no matter what, and a God that will not punish sin no matter what. Maybe mass murderers, maybe they get it, but not me. And they create their own God, and they, they love that God because they designed that God. They made a God after their own fashioning, the way they want that God to look like. And then you tell them about Jesus, like, Oh, no, I do not like that. Well, then you don't love the true God. The only God you love is the God you made up in your mind, all right? So if you truly love the one true God, you will accept and believe uh, the Son and love the Son. Also, for, before we leave 41 and 42, notice that they, uh, they say that they are not born out of sexual immorality. They are truly belonging to Abraham. And most, most likely... This, they're not they're speaking physically here. Most likely, they're starting to catch on that Jesus is talking spiritually. In the Old Testament, it was very common uh, when, the, when the Israelites went off and served other gods, and they made idols, right? God would compare this to sexual sin as far as you've committed adultery. You have left the covenant relationship but that I have made with you, and you have committed adultery, as in a marriage, and it's, it's similar as far as the metaphor is concerned. So they are saying, no, we have not committed spiritual uh, fornication, that we have remained true. They're probably, to an extent, saying we are part of the remnant, of the true spiritual children of Abraham. That's who we are. It's another boast. So they're physically and spiritually connected to Abraham. Uh, look at number uh, verse 43. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. So number five, the reason that they are, it is revealed that they are not truly connected to Abraham is that they cannot bear to hear Christ's message. This is something for us to think on too. Do you know those who claim to be right with God, claim to be, yet have no desire for the word of God. And everyone can probably answer, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know those kind of people, right? Uh, what does this reveal? Well, it reveals that they don't truly love God. If you truly love God, you would love 
the words that are coming out of his mouth. They would, they would love the words that have been inspired and breathed out by him. But if you don't love the word of God, this is very revealing that you don't actually love God. And you, maybe you've tried to talk to people like that, uh, that claim to love God, and then you try to share the, with them the words of God, and they'll say, I don't like to talk about religion or something to that effect. Oh, I, I don't want to bring, it, bring the Bible into this. Like, you just said you loved God. <laughs> We're talking about God's word, right? These things go together. You can't separate them. But oftentimes you see them separated by those, again, who have created their own God. And they want to, to do what they think that God tells them to do. But when you read the word and they're corrected by it, they don't like that connection. They don't, they don't have an affinity for the word of God. All right, so they cannot bear the message of Christ. They do not like it. Now, and this can be applied, uh, these, these points that we're pointing out can definitely be applied today. Many times people think that they are right because of their ancestry. And even today, you still find some people who claim, just like the Pharisees did then, that they are connected to Abraham and that they are right before God because of that. And you can still find people that actually believe that today. I think more common in, in our scenario, in our situation, in our culture, you find people, though, who claim to be right with God based upon their parents or their grandparents' faith. And children, for example, uh, listen closely. You are not right with God just because your parents are Christians. And that needs to sink in. And parents need to understand that as well. Uh, your children are not right with God because you personally have faith. And if you, they begin to claim that they are based upon your faith, or you claim that they are based upon your faith, you're falling into the same logical mistake, spiritual mistake that the Pharisees were claiming here. Uh, we are connected to him, Abraham. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not. You, that's not how it is passed down. You have to have the same faith. You had to personally believe in Christ for your salvation, Christian, or children, right? So we don't want to make the same mistake here either. Each person must have faith in Christ for his or her own salvation. Christianity is not passed down by genetics. Uh, Galatians 3, 7 says this, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So how do you know if you have the faith? that Abraham had, your faith will be obeying God. It will be seeing Jesus Christ, acknowledging who he is, submitting to his authority. Your works will be there that reflect that, and you will love Christ. Uh, in verse 44, Jesus states clearly uh, that he has, what he has been alluding to, that they have a different father. So let's look over there at verse 44. Here he has been alluding to it. He's been speaking kind of about it in a roundabout way. All the same conversation, though. He finally brings it to this climactic head here and says, You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Now, this is shocking. You can only imagine. You have the Pharisees who dress different, who act different, who are judging everyone on, on the Sabbath, making sure everyone's living by the rules, but yet Jesus calls them whitewashed tombs, right? They work out on the outside to look pretty before man for the approval of man, but they're dead on the inside. But you have these religious leaders who claim over and over to be representing God to the people, who represent themselves as truly belonging to Abraham, Abraham is our father, even God is our father. And what does Jesus say in verse 44? You are of your father, the devil. Their paternity test is not going well, all right? Uh, the answer is coming back. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Now, this is quite shocking. And something to consider. Uh, do you find it shocking that most religious people in Israel at the highest positions of authority were actually following Satan? That, that, think about that for a moment. You have, you have the Pharisees, you have the Sadducees, you have the 71 that, that make up the Sanhedrin, the ruling, ruling elders there, the high priest making that 71st one. Um, but they're all following Satan. 
but yet they're working at the temple. They're in the temple. They look different. They represent. They claim to have right belief. They claim to represent God. They claim to be teachers of God to other people. Yet Jesus is saying, you are of your follow, or father, the devil. Uh, those who follow Satan, this is really important, rarely profess to do so. Let that sink in. Those who follow Satan rarely profess to do so. Instead, they profess to follow God. If you added up all those who claim to follow Satan today, the number is minuscule. It is such a small number. But if you add it up, all those who claim to believe in God, who claim to represent God, but do not do so accurately, the number is staggering, right? I mean, think of, think of those who claim to be right with God, but have changed his word, do not submit to his word, have changed the definition of Jesus, changed the definition of God himself. You think of like Mormons, for instance, right? or Jehovah Witnesses even as well, or, or cults, or Texas Branch Davidians, or whatever. Did any, do any of them claim to follow Satan? No. Who do they claim to follow? They claim to follow God. If Satan, if someone came up to you dressed uh, like Satan and had horns on his head and a pitchfork in his, his hand and said, ah, yeah, we worship Satan. You want to join us? You're like, oh, obviously not. That's bad, right? But that's not how Satan presents himself. Satan presents himself as an angel of light. And, and it's, it's changing doctrine. It's, it's presenting God, but it's not the right God. And here, this, you see, this is what's happening. Uh, none of those Pharisees or Sadducees are looking like Satan or necessarily or claiming, you might say, to represent Satan. They're, they're claiming to represent the patriarch Abraham. They're claiming to represent God himself. But yet Jesus, being all-knowing, seeing right to the heart of it, he says, your father is the devil. It's like, wow. Do you realize how polar opposite this is from what they think and what people see them as? They are not representing God at all. They're representing Satan himself. And uh, Jesus, of course, sees their will, sees their desires. He sees to the very heart of the man, and they're following Satan, not God. Uh, look at number six here. We're going to come to uh, the revelation of who their father is is further supported by just seeing their will, seeing their desire, seeing their heart. And that is their desire and will is to serve Satan and not God. And this is how they, Jesus knows that they're not truly Abraham's children, his offspring. They're not connected to him spiritually because they're doing the opposite. They're actually desiring their will and desires is to serve Satan not God himself. They appeared right with God on the outside, but Jesus saw straight through that. In what ways do their will, does their will and desires line up with their fathers? It's revealed here in verse 44 that they desire to murder and lie. And that's what Jesus reveals. He says, he was a murderer, speaking of the devil, from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So how is, why, why is Jesus saying that he was a murderer from the beginning? Most likely, this is going back to the Garden of Eden, right? Where God says, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And Satan comes along and starts his lying. He starts his deception and, and gets Eve to take a bite of the tree. So he, Jesus is connecting that he was a murderer from the beginning and a liar from the beginning. And that the children of, of supposed Abraham here, the Pharisees, are looking just like him. Because they want to murder the Holy One. And they are lying. As we've seen, they've made up lies about Jesus. That he's not actually from Bethlehem. That he's not actually from the line of David. That he's not the Messiah. They're, what does this reveal? reveals that God is not their father. The father of lies is their father. And remember how Satan would, would lie. It was all, it's never, it's never, again, it's never just bold, outright, just obvious. Again, it's, he's not coming to you like that. He comes to Eve, and what does he say? It's like, oh, hey, by the way, God's holding this back from you. I know you have a million other fruits here, but this one is the best one, right? And it's, it's just, he's holding this back. If you just partook of it, 
uh, you would be like him. You would be God also. It's like, it's just, whoa, this is enticing. It's luring, right? And that's the way temptation works. And that's the way Satan's lies work. Uh, fast forward to when Jesus is tempted. It's, it's, he would even use the word of God in the lies that he would tell, twist it and dis, try to deceive Jesus. Did it work? Obviously not. But from those two accounts, we see how the deceiver works, how he can trick, how he can manipulate. And these lies are, are subtle, but they have huge ramifications. All right. So Satan is a murderer from the beginning, a liar from the beginning. How does this connect to the Pharisees? They have the same exact desires that Satan does. Verse 45 and verse 46. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? And here Jesus gives the reason that they do not believe him. It is because he tells the truth. And truth is highly offensive to those who believe lies. This can be said of many things today in our lives going on and around, all right? Uh, but you speak the truth, and people that have believed a lie hate your truth, and they hate you for bringing that truth. But this also goes with the message of Christ, the message of the gospel. Uh, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to adjust your truth so they will be happy with you? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, never alter the truth of God's word to make it more acceptable to those who belong to Satan. This is important truth for us to remember. We never alter the saving message of the gospel to make it more acceptable to those who are children of Satan. You present the gospel fully with all of the truth out there, and then you let God do what God is going to do. Uh, when you see Paul going to the Jews to present the gospel, he never backed off or only gave them some of the truth. He boldly presented the gospel, and God would use that message to save some of them. Others would pick up rocks and try to kill him, all right? But he did not adjust the gospel. He did not adjust the truths of Jesus to, to, to make amends, to make them a little more happy with him, because the power of the gospel is for salvation. So he presents that gospel to them for salvation. So the Pharisees here, Jesus is preaching pure truth. He is the truth. He cannot lie. And they do not believe him. There's no sin in him, but they do not believe him. All right, verse 47, last one we're going to cover today. Jesus says, whoever is of God hears the word of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. All right, so the paternity test is basically over here. They claim to be right with Abraham. Uh, Jesus has gone through this test. He says, you're not because, number one, they reject the word of God. Number two, they do not do the works that Abraham did. Number three, they do the works of another father. Number four, they do not love Jesus. Number five, they cannot bear to hear Christ's message. Number six, their desire is and, uh, and will is to serve Satan, not God. What does all this mean? Well, as Jesus said earlier, look, here's the test. You have failed, 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 failed. Abraham is not your father. Satan is. God is not your father. Satan is your father. So they have failed this paternity test. That is the conclusion of their test. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved... It is the power of God. The, this is extremely important for us to wrap our minds around today. Uh, many people who claim to believe in Jesus, who claim to be disciples of Jesus, who claim to be right with God, uh, are not necessarily so. There should be these things in order. Uh, their heart, their will, desires, and actions will believe, will, will, um, will reveal, sorry, that's what I was looking for, their identity. So today, as you sit here even, who is your father, right? Do you love Jesus? What do your works reveal about you? Uh, not, not that you rely on them for salvation, but they should reveal a change from your will, from your heart, because God has given you a new heart. Do you love the Jesus of the Bible, right? Do you welcome him? These are things that do you have right belief, right faith. These are how we are connected to Abraham. This is how we are right with God. 
So think on these things today. And also, uh, do not be deceived because we know that there are people in the world who claim, just like the Pharisees did, to be right with God, but who are not right with God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us your word to study today, to submit to today. And I pray, Lord, that as we, we go through this chapter in chapter 8, we see these religious leaders who claim to be right with you, but in a matter of moments, it is revealed that they are not. God, we know that you are omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. You know all things. And that the Pharisees could not hide their hearts from you, and neither can we. Lord, number one, we pray if there's anyone here today who has not believed truly in you for salvation, that even now, God, that you would open their hearts. May they see their sin. May they see what they were relying on for their own salvation as wrong, as false, being deceived by Satan, and that will not lead to heaven. May they see that they need a true, righteous Savior one who has never sinned, one who is God and man, who lived in our, on our, in our behalf, who died on the cross to take our sin, to take the wrath that we deserve, and to give us his righteousness. God, may they submit to your word and listen to that and, and, and truly believe like Abraham did. And Lord, I pray for us who are believers. God, may our works in this life uh, truly reveal to others. May people see that we are not of this world, that, we, that it's, the devil is not our father, but that we are truly submitting to your word and that you are our father. May this be revealed by the way we love you, may the, by the way we love one another, and by the way we submit to your word. In Jesus' name we pray.